Well, good morning. It is so good to be with you guys. We are almost to Christmas. I am very excited. This is one of my favorite times of year. And if this is your very first Sunday here at Northlands, I uh, just want to give you an, another special welcome. My name is Tyler. I'm one of the pastors here at Northlands Church, uh, and we're just so glad that you're a part of our time together. You're joining us as we've been in a series for the month of December called Joy to the World. And this series is inspired by our Give Joy project. What we mean by that is, is really for the month of December, our hope is less about inviting you just to hear a message and more about inviting you into a practice to, to grow in generosity, grow in service, grow in love and mercy for those that we are called to serve around us. And so so we hope that these messages would inspire you to get involved with the project. We're excited to be wrapping up the project uh, today, but we'll be celebrating next week for our Christmas service, and I'm looking forward to that time. I want to do a a bit of recap as we dive into my message. There's some things that we've seen over the last couple weeks that I think we need to highlight that will help us get where we need to be going today. In week one for this Joy to the World series, Greg preached a message called who is my neighbor? We asked the question, who is it that God has called us to serve? And then what I loved is that in week two, Tom spoke about the beauty of generosity. And I believe with all my heart, those two messages go very much hand in hand because they relate to the questions that Jesus was asked in his time on earth by people. People had questions for Jesus and they were asking specific questions to get a specific answer from Jesus. So for example, this lawyer comes to Jesus one day it feels like I'm setting up a joke, but I'm not. A lawyer, a lawyer walks in with, with Jesus one day. A lawyer comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, can you tell me who is my neighbor? And what he was trying to ask Jesus is, Jesus, can you narrow it down for me exactly who is it that I have to serve? G- generosity. How much do I actually have to give? Would you tell me that, Jesus? Why were they asking that question? Because the moment they could get an exact answer... They got a very specific answer. It left everything else up to interpretation for their own life. Jesus, if you can just tell me exactly how much I have to give, tell me exactly who I'm supposed to serve, how I have to serve, if you can just tell me that, then I can go on with the rest of my day. And Jesus didn't do that. It would seem that every time people would ask a question about who is my neighbor, how much do I have to forgive, how much do I have to give, Uh, Jesus, you keep talking about loving your enemies, what's all that about? The more questions like that to narrow it down, it would seem that Jesus would continually answer them in a way that would expand the story. Jesus tells a story, and this is what Greg highlighted in week one, of the Good Samaritan. He tells a story of a man goes to traveling in a city. While he's traveling down the road, he's attacked by robbers and left for dead in the street. This Jewish man is met by two other Jewish brothers who walk by at different times. Both have reasons of why they don't have to serve the man or help the man. Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a priest, I'm a Levite. If I mess with you, now I become unclean. You don't want to put me out as well. Then we're both out. Come on. So, so they give a reason to keep walking. And then Jesus says, a third man comes. And this man's not Jewish, he's actually a Samaritan. And everybody that Jesus was talking to at that time knew exactly what was going on because Samaritans were enemies with the Jews. There was a racial tension there. And so everybody knew this guy, there's no way this guy is going to stop. But Jesus says that's actually exactly what happens. The man took pity on the one who was hurt, helps him, takes him to an inn where he pays for all of his care necessary to see the man healed and whole. And Jesus leaves the story with the lawyer and says, tell me who do you think the neighbor is? And then the lawyer obviously answers, the one who is kind. Jesus, tell me exactly who is my my neighbor. Narrow it down for me exactly. Jesus says, anybody with a need is your neighbor. Week two, Tom goes into James chapter one, verse five. But when it comes to generosity, if anybody lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Statement about God's nature. Who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. Jesus, tell me exactly, who is my neighbor and how much do I need to give them? You should give to everybody who has a need. That is your neighbor. And you should give to them generously to all without finding fault. When people tried to narrow the answer down, Jesus continually expanded their horizons. And so in week uh, three, I want to talk about service. And I want to preach a message today called Known for Their Service. Uh, I, I, with my daughter Evangeline, there's this interesting thing she's doing now at the house. She'll be running around the house playing, doing her thing, and then she'll stop, and she'll run up to Nicole, and she'll pause, and she'll look at Nicole, and if Nicole's not paying attention, she'll just go, Mommy, you have pretty eyes. 
And Nicole goes, thanks. They are so blue, mommy. And so then Nicole will go, baby, you have very pretty eyes too. <sighs> thanks. <laughs> now, I'm watching this from over here and I want to be a part of the love fest and I know how to get a compliment. In order to, get a, in order to catch a compliment, you got to fish for that compliment. So I go to my daughter, I go, baby, daddy thinks you have the most prettiest of eyes in the entire world. They are so blue. <sighs> Thanks, Daddy. And now I'm sitting there and... Do you have anything you want to tell Daddy? <laughs> whatever comes to mind. Look into my eyes and just whatever. You speak from the heart. I don't want to manufacture your answer. She goes, I like your beard. It's, it's so soft. Do you feel it? It's so soft. Mommy, feel the beard. If I asked you the question... What are you most known for? What's the thing that sticks out the most? What do people see when they see you? What do they think about when they think about you? What is it that, that you are most known for? What's as plain as the beard on your face? If you're a lady, that doesn't make sense for you, but it's just, <laughs> or it does, and then we got to, anyway, hey, oh, it's almost Christmas. I can have fun. Here we go. What are you most known for? Perhaps when people think about you, perhaps they say, he's always so encouraging, or perhaps they say he's always making others feel small. Perhaps they say she is always so cheerful. Or she always finds a reason to complain. Perhaps, man, he finds the good in every single situation. Or perhaps when they think about your life and your actions, they say, man, they will find the smallest flaw or the smallest weakness and point it out. What are you most known for? What do you want to be known for? My daughter, I, I, the older she gets, I get, I, I'm one part proud and one part just incredibly nervous all the time in my life. She, she's in this moment now where she's speaking in phrases and sentences. Before it was one word here or there, but now when she says a phrase, it becomes undeniable where the phrase came from. The inflection she uses, the tone that she uses, the sense of humor, the adorable smile. I don't know where she gets it from. And so what happens is I'm incredibly proud because I go, that's a mini me. I know exactly where she got that. I love what she adopted. And on the other side, I'm like, please don't say that in front of your mom. Like, please, I'm just asking. It'll be our little secret, it's fine. It leads to another question I, I wanna ask you. What is it that you're known for? The second question, what is it that you would want people to adopt from your life? If there was something, if parent, if you could download something to your kids like right now, what would it be like? I mean, if there's one thing that would help them in life, if there's one thing that I've learned in my life, here's the thing that I want to give them. What is it that you want to have others adopt from knowing you or being with you? Jesus was abundantly clear about what he was hoping people would adopt from his life when he walked the earth. What he was hoping to reveal to people continually as he bumped into them, he was, he was abundantly clear of this is who I am, this is what I want to be known for, this is what I hope you, met, you uh, imitate, that you adopt from my life. And we see it Excuse me, in John chapter 13, we see Jesus is speaking with his disciples. And what's unique about this moment is Jesus knows he is getting ready to die. So he's in this place right now where he goes, this is going to be a final moment with me and my best friends. And he says, he says I, I want to give you guys one last thing to leave you with that I hope you've already caught from my life. This wasn't the first time Jesus talked to him about it. He's saying, I hope there's something that you've caught about who I am, the kind of person that I am, the kind of person I am praying that you guys will become and be like. There's one thing that I want to give you. Here's a, here's a new command I want to give you. And he said this. He says, I, I want you to love one another. What's so unique about that is that that is not a new commandment, especially to his Jewish brothers that he was talking to, because in the, in the law and with Moses, there was the command already, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is not a new commandment. But then Jesus did something that made it new. And we see it right here in the scripture. He said this, just as I have loved you, love one another. Just as I have of you, what kind of person was Jesus? Who was he to his disciples? He's, he'd been with them now for three years. They had watched him minister. In other words, he's saying, guys, love one another exactly as I have loved you. You want to know the standard? You want to know who is your neighbor? You want to know how to love somebody? Do it like I did. And what aspect of my life did I leave off the table for somebody to take hold of? When was there a need that somebody came to me with and I didn't meet it? 
If they wanted healing, I gave it to them freely. If they wanted mercy and kindness, I showed them mercy and kindness. When people wanted to accuse them, I said, there's no accuser here. Jesus said, what, what needs did I say? Nope, that's, that's not for me, that's for somebody else. That's somebody else's responsibility. Jesus says, this way that I've lived my life, I want you to love like that. But then he goes on and he says this, verse 35, by this, by this kind of love, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus is saying, as plain as the beard on your face, I want you to be known for your love and your service to others. I want it to be a glaring feature about you. And this is what I love about Jesus, is that Jesus was no ordinary king. He was a servant king through and through. A king has dominion in his kingdom. And if you're going to be in that kingdom, you do what the king says. But so, what's so unique about this call and this command, the king wasn't just giving a command. What he was doing is he was saying, I have modeled this for you. I have empowered you to live like this. Why? Because this is who I am. Jesus wasn't just a king saying, yeah, that's for you to do. That's a servant's job. That's not my job. Jesus is saying, this is the same passage where Jesus washed his own disciples' feet. The lowest type of service Jesus himself did. He goes, was there any part of my life that I didn't give? Was there any action? Was there anything that I wasn't willing myself to do? Why? Because it's who I am. I love Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for we are God's handiwork. You and I were created by God with intentionality and with purpose in mind. And it continues, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What does this mean? It means Jesus is not saying, go and prove to the world that you are a disciple of mine by performing acts of service, by manufacturing a practice that you really don't want to do, but you have to prove that you're not a hypocrite, that you have to prove that you're a little bit more holier than thou. Go, he's not saying go and perform something. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, show the world that I am alive in you by allowing my spirit to reign through you. In other words, Jesus isn't inviting us to perform acts of service. He is inviting us to be one with him. Service to mankind was not something that Jesus did. It was who he was in the flesh. In other words, service is not some sort of action that we do, but rather it's an identity that we are established in. If there's something that I want to leave us with today, a big idea for me is this, is that service is not something that we do. Service is the overflowing result of who we are. I want to say it one more time, because that's, if, if my whole message in that statement, if there's one thing that I want us to convey, service is not something we are called to do for our city. Service is simply an overflowing result of who we were made to be. We are one with Christ. Let his spirit of, spirit of perfect charity reign in you richly. This is the call to being a Jesus follower. I love this because when we talk about it as the form of an identity and not an action that we are trying to manufacture, it literally equalizes every single one of us. In other words, it's not for the very rich to be generous. It's for the very rich and for the very poor to live out a spirit of generosity. It's not just for the person who's got a lot of time on their hands. Well, they should be the one who serves first. No, every single one of us is called to serve in any way that we see that's available and ready to be serving in. It's, it's, it's not for saying, well, you know, I could be a better servant or I could love or be more kinder if my spouse was like that or if I had friends like that or if I was in that neighborhood, then it would be easier for me to be like that. That's all describing actions that you're trying to perform to. Jesus is saying, surrender to my spirit, and out of the abundance of your heart will flow generosity, service, charity, kindness, love. This is not something that we are called to do. This is an identity that we are established in. It's who we are. And so as we go into 2020 and the years beyond, here's what I'm hoping for from this, from this community, especially that we would recognize this Give Joy project. I love this project so, so much, but I hope you understand this, that the Give Joy project is not something that we do in the month of December as a church so we can check off and go, well, this is how we impact our city. That's not what this project is about. This project is really to be an exclamation point at the end of the year for a community of people who are committed to being servants. This is simply an overflowing result of who we are called to be. 
And so if I could leave us with three things today, this is what I'm hoping for. If, if, if service is not something that we do, but it's an overflow of who we are, then I wanna talk about who we are called to be and who we should be known as in our city and in our community. So here are the three things. Number one, we will be known as the people who think differently. We will be known as the people who think differently. Or, uh, I've been a part of a community group for the last several years. It's a marriage uh, group that's in Norcross. And uh, it's, a fun, it's a fun group. We absolutely love it. And, and we do two things. On, on one week, we have dinner and we just connect with one another. And on the second week, what we do is we invite a couple to come in and just share their life with us. We say, hey, share your stories. We want to learn from your marriage. So these are people who have been married for 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years. And we just want to glean from them. And we invited some friends of mine. If you haven't had a chance to meet them, Russell and Franny Reese, they're beautiful people in our community. We absolutely love them. They live in, in, uh, in, a, in Norcross, right, right down the road from Nicole and I. And so we invited them to come and be a part of our community group. And they said something to me. This was earlier this year, but it still has stuck with me that just fits so well about thinking differently. Uh, they looked at their life and they were telling the story. They said, hey, this is what we were focused on in our 20s. This is what we were focused on in our 30s and our 40s and our 50s. And they said something that just grabbed my heart about their 40s. They said, 40s for us felt like this kind of beautiful, blessed, golden age for us. The Lord was so faithful in a thousand different ways. We, we felt like we still had the energy uh, that we had in our 20s and our 30s, but we'd also collected wisdom along the way and life experience, and we felt like we were just hitting a groove. It was just, life was getting easier and easier, it felt. Their kids were going through high school to college, and so parenting was becoming a little bit more, less and less involved in the day-to-day. -day. Uh, the careers were exactly where they needed to be. Finances were healthy. All of these things, the things were just flowing smoothly. And they said, one night we had this meeting and we talked about where we're going from here as we just saw this momentum picking up. And it was so clear. They said, uh, it was like we had the American dream right in front of us, that everything was moving exactly according to plan. And we thought for a moment, you know, if we only made our life about this, we could totally launch and do even more. We could, we could grow our finances, be in a bigger house, drive nicer cars. We could send our, our, our kids to, to the schools of our dreams. We could just keep going and doing this. And if we just focused on this, we could easily have the American dream. I think Russell said something like, it felt like we had like one foot in. You know, we already had one foot ready to go. And it's like, all we had to do is go, we're going to make our life about this. They said this, though, that just grabbed me. They said, nothing wrong with this quote-unquote American dream, but if we made our life only about focusing on us, he said, this kind of a story felt too small to subscribe our life to. Don't miss that. This kind of pursuit is too small of a thing for us to give our entire lives to. And they said, we felt the expansion come when we started continually looking for more and more and more opportunities to serve our neighbors and to serve in our communities. There's an invitation. God, tell me, who is my neighbor? How much do I have to give? What is it that I, what, give me the exact details of what I need to do so then I can go and pursue my thing. And just as Jesus says, man, Anybody with a need, generously without finding fault. This is how we're to live our lives. What is it doing? It's expanding the story of our lives. It's inviting us into a kingdom and gospel narrative that is far bigger than just us. We will be a people who think differently. I, was, uh, I ran for, for Norcross City Council over the last couple months, and there was this fascinating thing that I noticed about door knocking. Absolutely loved it. Thought it was, I loved connecting with my neighbors but as I looked at this, what, what, I was talking with Greg about this, and we found that, man, it, a person's capacity is reflected in the problems that occupy their mind. And, and, and what I mean by this, I would knock on some people's doors, and I would say, hey, tell me about, what's the, what's the need that you're passionate about? about? How, do we, how do we make Norcross better? And some people would go, I'm so glad you, nobody ever asked me. Thank you for asking. I don't know if you noticed, but on the front street in front of all the businesses, the flower pots, they're different colors. And some of them are different sizes. I'm like, no, different sizes, you say. That was the big, ooh. Some people, you knock on their door, though, and you go, hey, would you tell me about what's the thing that you're passionate about, about making Norcross a better place to live? And they go, man, if we would just focus on these three things over the next five years, we could revolutionize our education system. That's big. When we make it about the things that we're passionate, the little things that we're focused on, it's a reflection of our capacity. Now, I want to bring out this point. The stuff that fills your mind, it reveals the narrative that you are choosing to subscribe to. And are you subscribing to a worldly small way of thinking? 
Or are you allowing the kingdom of God to be advanced in your life and in turn inviting yourself into a much bigger story? What are the things that occupy your mind the most? Number two. Number two, one, we're going to be uh, known as the people who think differently. Number two, we will be known as the people who honor relentlessly. We will be known as the people who honor relentlessly. I love Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 10. It says this, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Check out this statement. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. Let our works be continually about, no, 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 I've got to highlight you for a moment. No, 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 you, no, 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 you, no, you. Let us continually outdo ourselves in lifting one another up and honoring what is honorable in our lives. Let's honor God and let's honor one another for the incredible things that he's doing in our lives. This is so counterculture, though. I've read these, like, these couple different uh, surveys from 2010, 2017, so some farther back, some recent all hitting kind of the same numbers. It was fascinating. They, they surveyed thousands of teenagers and they asked the question, what would you like your career to be when you grow up? What would you like your career to be when you grow up? And 54% had this answer. They said, either a celebrity or some form of fame will be required for my future. 54% of people said, you know what? I've got, I've, got to, I've got to get that celebrity status. I've got to be, I got to be an influencer. I've got, to, I've got to have my YouTube channel. I've got, to, I've got to have subscribers. I'm not against any of that necessarily. But the idea that 54% of people are saying, you know what, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, but I know it's going to be pretty great and people are going to need to watch. Fascinating. And don't, before, <laughs> some of you are like, I know, the millennials and Gen Z, this was not, this is not a, this generation. This is in every generation and culture. This was going back as far as Jesus' time, and I'll prove it right here. Matthew 20, uh, verse 20 to 28. It says this, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and a mom shows up. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine will sit one on your right and one on your left in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, do you not know what you are asking? Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And then the 10 heard it. And they were indignant at the two brothers. And they were mad because they just didn't think about getting their moms involved. Let's just be really clear. <laughs> Let's be abundantly clear. They were like, we should have gotten our moms to ask Jesus. I could just see that mom be like, Jesus, excuse me, I have one question to ask you about my boy. It's a, <laughs> they're, indignant, they're indignant with these two brothers, but not because they're like, how could you ask that? They're like, we should have asked it first. And Jesus says this. You know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, the people. And their great ones exercise authority over them. And then he says this, It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, the, the disciples are seeing the day, the day that they are living in. They go, man, those leaders, the power that they have, the way that they wield authority, we want that. And Jesus might actually be the vehicle to get us there. That's what they were thinking. And Jesus was saying, guys, 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 if there's anything that you've learned from me, this kind of worldly idea of how power and influence is used, so worldly. Think differently. Not so among you. That, that is far too small of a story to subscribe yourself to. You can totally, we can, you want to go after that? We can totally go after it. But, but personally for me, I'm, I'm, I'm the king in my kingdom. That doesn't get celebrated. What gets celebrated in Jesus' kingdom is who he is. You want, to be, you want to be great in the kingdom? We're going to become servants because that's who I am. Jesus again invites them. Hey, if you, want, you can subscribe to any story in your life, but if you're going to follow me, this is the story we're subscribing to. And I promise you, it's far greater than that one. That will go away in this life, I promise you. In the, in the ages to come, those who will be celebrated in the champions among us are those who are our greatest servants. 
We live in a culture that's no different from Jesus' day where people wanted to build a platform so that they could influence. And Jesus' whole point was to say, no, 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 no. We will be a platform and we will lift our brothers and sisters up, continually elevate or outdoing one another in honor. How should we be known for our service that we would be a people who think differently? We don't subscribe to the world's small story and we certainly will be relentless in our honor for one another and for God. Number three, what will we be known in in our city? We will be known as the people who love unconditionally. We will be known as the people who love unconditionally. I love this passage of scripture in Ephesians chapter one, verse three to five. It says this, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Verse five, fascinating. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. Some people get nervous in church when you start talking about predestination. I personally like to lean into the awkward. Everybody has their their ideas of what predestination means. Personally, as I look at this scripture, God is talking about himself in a predetermined posture that he has. He's He's not saying, oh, I've predestined some to be adopted sons and some will be those who are hated and going to hell. That's not what Jesus is doing. What Jesus is saying is, I have predestined, I have predetermined adoption in my heart for the creation of the world. Before the creation of the world, God, who is the same today, yesterday, and forever, he said, this is how I am approaching mankind. When Moses met with God on the mountaintop and he saw the burning bush, God revealed himself to Moses as I am. And what that means in our translation, it means something to the effect of I be who I be. It's a fascinating turn of phrase. What he means by that is he is saying, there is no external circumstance or person that determines who I am. This is who I am and nothing changes that. So so the example I've given before is I am a father and I am a husband because I have a daughter and I have a wife. If you remove those two from my life, I am neither a father nor a husband. This is not so with God. God be who he be, and he will not be dictated by. What does that mean? It means before the foundations of the world, before the foundations of the world were even set in place, he said, we're gonna make men in our image. God came with a predetermined disposition. Before there was ever anything to reconcile, redeem, or to restore, God was a reconciler and a redeemer and a restorer. That is who he is. You coming on the scene didn't make him that. He was already that. What does that mean? It means every circumstance in your life, everything that you have faced up until this point, God knew exactly how he felt about you. In your worst day, think about, don't miss this, on your worst day on earth where you've screwed up so bad, God's heart did not sway in the slightest towards his feelings for you. And Jesus said, you will be known for that kind of love. That's how my disciples are, a predetermined disposition of how we are called to act and to treat people. I had a friend of mine who who took this to heart and he said this when when it came to financing and doing his budget. He said, I have my budget for eating out and right next to it I have my budget for, for the percentage that I'm going to tip my server. Meaning before he even walks into a restaurant, he goes, this is how much the meal will cost and this is how much the percentage I'm going to give in regardless of how the service is. Because he said, my generosity of what I'm going to give somebody will never be dictated by the service that they give me. Tom and I were talking about this. We would argue that that's not even generosity. If I'm giving to you based off of how you're doing, how is that generous? It's not how Jesus would describe generosity. Generosity. It's a fascinating thing when you go and you say, I'm here to serve my city. I'm here to serve my community. I'm here to serve among this church community here. And my service, my love, my mercy, my kindness, my generosity, it is not determined by how I am treated. It will be determined by who is in the inside of me and who I am letting reign in my life. This is the kind of people we are called to be. We will be a people who think differently. We will be a people who will continually honor relentlessly and we will love with no strings attached, no conditions. The Give Joy Project is not about getting Northland's brand out there. It's about the fact that there are people in our city who deserve our love, not because they earned it, not because they have been worth it, not because of anything that they have done to us, but simply because when it comes to God, they are the object of his affection. And because God loves them, 
we deeply love them as well, and we will pour out our life like a drink offering for them. This is what we are called to do. Service is not something we do. Service is the overflowing result of who we are and who is Lord on the inside of us. I love the fact that this holiday season, what we talk about in this time of the year is the fact that Jesus, King of glory, decided to strip himself of all his glory, authority, and power and surrender it so that he could come into a time in creation in the weakest form of us, an infant baby. And he didn't grow up in a palace. He was born and birthed into the dirt and the grime of our existence here. And if we don't think differently, we go, man, who would ever do such a thing? But Jesus saw a much bigger story. It's a timeless story that we are telling again and again and again throughout time. It's his story that he made himself very small and humbled himself so that we might be a part of his greater story. That was at work, salvation of mankind. I love this invitation, and anytime I preach, I love when I get the opportunity to say it. Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, verse 29, Jesus said, come to me, all who are hungry and thirsty. And he says this about himself, for I, my identity, I am humble and gentle in spirit, and I am here that you might find rest for your soul. What kind of king does that? A king who is known for his service. And he calls and invites us to be a part of that story. If you're here today and you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, I just, I hope you heard that there's a story that is going on still. It began, it began before the foundations of the earth. Jesus put it in place when he was born into this earth and his death and resurrection was the thing that launched us into it and invites us in. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I would love to talk to you after this service because I want you to hear about this incredible, incredible person who is perfect charity and humility. He became that in the flesh and that's who he is. It's who we serve. Do not leave the same way that you came in. There's an invitation for you today. And I, and I don't know what frustrations or challenges that you're feeling in life, but I, 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 might, I might just argue that you were born as God's handiwork, which means you were born to be a part of a greater story. And if you're feeling frustration in your life, I might argue that it's just because you're walking in too small of a story for who you were made to be. And so we're going to close out. I'm going I'm to welcome Nathan to come up, but I'll, I'll be right here. And if, and if you want to talk more about Jesus or you want to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, would you come and see me or any of the ministry team that's up there? I'd love to pray for us today. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for the gift that was Jesus. Not only did he save us, Lord, but he taught us a better way a way that is filled with life and life more abundant. Lord, I pray right now that we as a community of people would cling to this story as our own, that we would adopt it into our own life. If there's anything for Northlands to be known for, let it be known that we are the greatest servants in our city, that it is evident that we have been with Jesus. Lord, let us be known as the people who will continually be about your kingdom and about your business, that we will continually honor and lift each other's heads up relentlessly as we continually love one another. Lord, I pray that we would love in complete abandonment, no conditions, just as you have done. Lord, I thank you for Christmas. I thank you for this season that we're reminded of your incredible gift. I pray that you just bless every family here, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks.